Okay, um, we will get this last session kicked off, I think. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and sticking with us. Uh, during the day, it's been a really exciting first year for Public History GradCon. Welcome to the final uh, panel, which is Public History and the Digital Turn. We have a lovely panel of practitioners who are going to be sharing with us their experiences of changing digital technologies in their professional lives, or perhaps the lack of digital technologies in their sort of digital world, professional worlds as well. Um, so we have going along here, Chris Tucker. Uh, Chris Tuckley. Chris Tuckley. Like, it's, good, it's always good to, to start off with the right names, isn't it? I remember the T in yours, Aisha. I've got it. And Chris is the Head of Interpretation and Learning with York Archaeological Trust. And we have Dr. Hannah Ishmael as well. Uh, she's the Collections and Research Manager of the Black Cultural Archives. We have Trey Venter as well. Um, he's a black, uh, he is a public historian of Black British history. He's a writer, poet, educator on raising your disability. And he's also a PhD candidate at Kingston. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we also have Holly Nielsen. Holly is a freelance gaming journalist and is also you're going to start your PhD at Royal Holloway. Or uh, you have started it? Yep, three years in. Oh Two, wow, three. okay. <laughs> My information is out of date. That's no, it's really exciting. But your area is uh, gaming and sort of late yes, 19th century. Yeah, late 19th yeah. century. Yeah, super exciting. And lastly, we also have Dr. Aisha Johnston with a T, very important T, and she is the Learning and Engagement Manager at the Black Cultural Archives as well. Um, for those who I've not had the pleasure of meeting, um, I'm Esther Wilson, I'm a second year PhD student um, at IPUP at York, and I look at history of digital cultures, looking at how digital platforms and social media is changing the ways in which people talk about and access the past. Um, so I will hand over to our lovely practitioners just to give a couple of minutes chat about their experiences with the technology, what they get up to um, in their professional capacities. So Chris, would you like to kick us off? Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm Chris Tuckley, Head of Interpretation and Learning for York Archaeological Trust and the Yorvik Group of Attractions and Events. I've worked in a range of roles for Yorvik since 2004. Uh, I do, I've do. i been saying to people today, I feel like a little bit of an interloper on this panel because I don't consider myself a digital heritage person at all really, but of course because of what happened in 2020 we were all sort of forced to become digital heritage people, often without a great deal of sort of planning or forethought really. Um, so my role uh, in a nutshell is looking after our formal learning offer at our attractions. We operate a number of attractions here in York as well as being a, an archaeological unit. Our most well-known venue is the Orby Viking Centre, but we also operate Dig, Barley Hall and the City Walls Experience here in York. So we have a schools learning programme uh, over which I have oversight. Um, I look after exhibition content both at our own attractions and in our, our touring exhibitions uh, portfolio as well. And then any events that are sort of explicitly on a um, on a learning theme or on an academic theme tend to tend to come to me as well. Um, as well as operating attractions, we've got a year-round events programme with a number of key festivals. The most well-known of which is the Yorvik Viking Festival, which happens um, happens every February. Um, so I guess that's that's me in a in a nutshell. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Hannah. I too. I'm an interloper, so maybe we can, I don't know, keep this thing going. Um, I am um, the Collections and Research Manager at Black Cultural Archives, which is a, an archive based in Brixton, South London, so also not moving, so double interloper. Um, so my main role is to look after the collections at Black Cultural Archives, which have been amassed since uh, the 1980s, but if we go back to our old site under the Roman coin, I don't talk about that because it's an object and I'm an archivist, so <laughs> be that, yeah, you can talk about that. Be that digital, you know, paper in the widest sense. Anyway, so one of the things that I really do think about is access and accessibility. And I guess thinking about this in a digital um, way, I do not burst in digital, in digital history particularly, but one thing that I do think about is that digital does not always equal access. And that's the thing that I kind of think about and come, come and bring, basically. And, you know, Archivists always hear, why didn't you digitise everything? And you know what? We have. But that is still not accessible because they sit on hard drives across the store, which is to my shame, basically. 
So one of the things that we think about is, yes, we could digitise everything, but as a small independent archive that does not get any governmental funding, we do not have the we don't really have the infrastructure to support access in any kind of meaningful way. And above and beyond that, because of the kind of nature of our collections, I also really think about um, access in terms of ethics and equity. So yes, we could digitise everything, we could put it on the internet, that is not really going to solve our problems. So I'll now leave, I'll, I'll kind of leave that. I bet Aisha can talk about some of the questions around what happens when you just stick everything on the internet. Hi, um, so I'm Shrey, I'm, I'm an art, first of all, I'm an artist, in that artist historian in that order. Um, did my undergraduate degree in creative writing at the University of Northampton um, and did my master's degree in race, education and decolonial thought during the COVID-19 pandemic actually. So I did my master's during lockdown um, with Leeds Beckett um, and my main focus is on black British histories um, and presenting those histories through different avenues. So I do a lot of it through spoken word, poetry and storytelling, but then other aspects I've done through journalism as well. Um, so when I was on my creative writing course, um, I did some journalism modules too, so I'm sort of, I guess, a hybrid of a person in terms of historian, artist, but also semi-journalist. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Black British histories, as that's as vague and as specific as it sounds. <laughs> um, so mainly from 18th century, 19th century onwards, um, also multidisciplinary, so what Amy was talking about in her paper with period dramas, so I moved quite a lot through those circles as well. Um, in both as a historian and as an, as an artist. So I, I, I take what's been used in period dramas in my talks and then plot it to the actual history. Because um, a lot of the times you're fighting people who are saying that black and brown people should not be in period dramas because it's historically inaccurate. And that's when you bring, basically, in that show, you bring the receipts. In that, in that, in that <laughs> time, you bring the receipts, um, which I've done on more than one occasion. So in terms of digital, um, Heritage, and I've used Twitter to that to that amount. So you will find Twitter threads of me talking about black people during the First World War and the Second World War, and and then Karen's online just being flummoxed, essentially. <laughs> um, but yeah, and at, at that point, I will pass on. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Holly. Uh, so, well, I may have taught a class with some of you, and some of you may not, unfortunately, because of strikes, but. Hello to some of you who may recognise me, but I am. Um, so I teach occasionally, um, I do uh, video games and play um, as public history. Uh, so my background is I was, a, I was a freelance journalist and arts critic for um, The Guardian and, well, freelancer, whoever would pay me, um, uh, for a few years. And I specialised in video games uh, and I did my kind of history degree alongside that. And I thought, oh, I'll combine the two. And I wrote about historical video games. Um, and so from there, I've written about historical video games quite a lot. Um, and I am currently doing my PhD at Royal Holloway. Um, and it's called uh, British Board Games and the Ludic Imagination, which is just a fancy way of saying British Board Games and Play. <laughs> but apparently that sounded better to funding. Um, uh, from about, uh, so I look at 1860 to 1960. So my academic research in that sense is um, deliberately pre-digital uh, for reasons because I think a lot of uh, games and play are within a digital bubble and so there's a longer history that's often ignored so that's what I try to do in my academic research um, but then I yeah I work as a, a writer and the last couple of years I've started working as a writer and narrative designer on video games so um, working with a, so made a game uh, with a with a development studio for a Experimenter, which is a um, science uh, centre in uh, Germany. We did a game for them for one of their exhibitions and yeah, and working on my own project at the moment. I was saying, I have to say this, because if I say this, then I have to publish it, because now it's out there, but about um, uh, interactive narrative, about um, ruins being a collaboration between the person experiencing them and the space themselves. And yeah, so using digital interactive narrative to do that. So I'm Aisha, I'm the Learning and Engagement Manager at Black Cultural Archives. Um, a range of different types of engagement sort of falls under my remit, so it's from workshops to school children, um, all the way up to university seminars, and then we also have engagement from um, adult groups, um, groups such as, say, the Genealogical Society, the Georgian Society, and then like corporate groups like Lloyds Bank or whoever that, that want to bring their staff to us for engagement. 
And normally all of this gets sort of squished into Black History Month. So we are in our Black History season right now, but it's just like a crazy whirlwind. And I mean, we do do things throughout the year as well, but this is understandably a sort of peak season, um, which we're happy about. It's great that people want to come. We just wish they'd come at other times <laughs> as well. Um, so when I started at BCA, I was just finishing my PhD in history. Before that, I was working with learning departments of various museums. And before that, in adult education. And I will also say I am a writer, and I have to say that, otherwise I'll never publish. <laughs> Historical fiction is my thing all the way. So from going from like um, adult education to museum education, to being a historian, to now working at Black Culture Archives, I didn't realize I was a public historian until I started to be asked to speak at public history events. And I started to think, well, actually, yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. Um, in terms of the um, digital, I guess the most obvious thing is when, again, I'm an interloper as well, we, we, we lock down and so suddenly all the schools are saying, can we have our engagement online? But whereas normally you'd have a class of, of 30 children, the, the schools want to sneakily put 60 in or 90 in, and you cannot possibly do an on, online workshop with 90 10-year-olds. So that's been a huge challenge. But even if it's just a classroom of 30, the interactivity element is, is completely removed. And we don't have a tech department, so we can't rely on the technology working. So all these fancy things like breakout rooms and so on, I'm always very wary of trying to use these things. And also it relies heavily on the adults who are in the room with the children to, to, to participate. So it's an area where I'm still kind of shying away from it. So with, when it comes to young people, with adults, absolutely fine, yeah. okay with that. Um, and just finally, we, are, we have a, um, a timeline of Black British history. It's a very big sort of physical exhibition which gets hired out to various places, but we are working on a digital version of it because obviously the limitations of something physical is that you can't change it, you can't add people to it, you can't take people away, and you can't really discuss things other than in a kind of chronological way. It's very difficult to kind of, kind of have thematic discussions. So the aim is that the digital timeline will allow for a lot more voices to be heard and just different ways of looking at this idea of, of, of black British history. Um, the timeline is from 100 AD to the present, but it doesn't have to be looked at in that way or limited by that. Um, yeah, thank you. No, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, I wonder if we could kick off with a really obvious topic about COVID-19 because I haven't actually heard it spoken as much as I thought I might have done during this conference generally. And I think it's something that's really relevant to the digital, um, especially we were chatting earlier, Chris, about that in your role. Um, and obviously, Aish, you just brought that up as well. And I'm wondering, um, a lot of us are here quite creative, whether that's writing or gaming or performing. Um, how do we think that the digital and the ideas about being creative in public history have sort of interacted over the recent years? Has technology helped people to be creative um, during COVID-19, with lockdowns, with the work you've been doing? Has it posed more challenges, do you think, than benefits? I mean, some people might say, over lockdowns, kids just sat in and played games. <laughs> I get that a lot, yeah. <laughs> That's what I did. But, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us did in some way. Um, but yeah, how, has it been a benefit, the digital, in terms of creative engagement with history, do you think? Over lockdown? Any I'll, thoughts? I'll start then, okay. I mean, for us, when, when the lockdown happened, I mean, it also coincided with the death of George Floyd and the Black Murder. Lives Matter movement. Huh? Murder. A, a big one. The murder of George Floyd and the, 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 the development of the Black Lives, or the publicising of the Black Lives Matter movement. So while we were all under lockdown, this was kicking off at the same time, and we were, on the one hand, trying to process that as individuals, but also thinking about what's our organisation response going to be, because suddenly the spotlight was on Black Cultural Archives and people wanted to engage with Black Cultural Archives, but we can't because we're closed. And so I would say, obviously, it, it, the benefit was that it did bring new audiences, most definitely, and it gave us that thinking, that space away from the day-to-day -to, -day to start thinking about how we can engage with audiences differently and how we can programme um, events. And so we did actually do the first, the first online, um, not the first online event ever, the first online event that I was involved in, which was a collaboration with an organization in the US. So it was called Bridging the Atlantic. So we were able to have a kind of global discussion on various topics. The, the, the main topic was, was, was what is blackness? So looking at, at, at Atlantic, looking at Africa, looking at various parts and bringing everybody together. So in a way it was a good thing. So it was bringing people together 
when everybody was really quite isolated, and it was bringing new audiences in. So at that point, it was like, oh great, there's this new thing, there's Zoom, there's Teams. I mean, it's probably been around for ages, but I didn't know about them. So it, at that point, it was a positive, but I'm sure other people can talk to how then that then was, became more challenging, how you can actually lose um, audience members as well through that. Um, so yeah, I'm sure, well, you said you did your master's during, yeah, because I, when I started my PhD, I was six months in, I think, and then COVID hit, and so that, really impacts you know how you do research and how you interact and it was great in some senses because yeah you do these online things and suddenly you're connected with a wider community than you would be if you were just say going to London and you're kind of limited geographically by who can actually attend that and all of a sudden you're seeing people from all over the world and that's brilliant but obviously you know there's a huge downside to that speaking to the kind of children being inside I think one thing that um the uh, lockdown really kind of made a space in many ways is our relationship to space and how that interacts with our relationship to digital space and the way that that often comes out in media and things like that is with children you know people panic and they go children at the screen time they're spending too much time online and it's been interesting watching that particularly not just from a digital games perspective but i guess just digital spaces in general is you know the the kind of delegitimization but then also the necessitation of these that's not my level, necessity of um of these digital spaces and particularly oh with children it is fascinating because um you know especially uh in places like london and urban settings children are demonized whatever space they're in you know if they're outside then they're loitering if they're you know and there's like all sorts of intersection of race and class that go into that um and so and so this kind of having to reckon with children and young people existing in online spaces and suddenly their educational spaces are now mostly online and I think there's just something very interesting around this kind of the kind of moral panic of and I think in some ways there's a, a kind of reaction to say that's a digital thing you know that's a thing that's a panic about the internet when actually I think it's something broader than that and something that's existed for a lot longer which is more to do with the spaces we want children to inhabit and the spaces we allow children to inhabit. Um, but yes, but that became particularly apparent around lockdown and seeing people and of course just the access to space and all of it. It was, yeah, that's at least what I noticed in my in my work. Um, well, of course, like after the after George Floyd um, was murdered by the police, uh, more organisations just all just out ticking boxes, being performative. Um, they were well, they were doing that before, but it it was to a larger um, tokenistic extent, especially especially um, universities. <laughs> Honestly, um, university that I work at, um, where well, I used to be an associate lecturer in criminology, um, when George Floyd was killed, I was actually um, a student union officer. Um, I was a sabbatical officer at my university student union for black and ethnic minority students. And I had to shame my university into making a statement on, on Twitter. <laughs> that, that's how that's how bad it was. And when they did make a statement, um, it was terrible. It was just it was just awful. <laughs> um, so to, to that extent, I saw how the democratization of social media um, was was there. There was information. So if you tweet something, um, people, most people that are going to see it will see it within I guess five minutes of the tweet, even if you delete it. Um, and then once it's been screenshotted, that's it as well. <laughs> that, that, even if you screenshot it, they're finished, essentially. Um, but in terms of my public history work, um, I did a lot of talks online in 2020, um, as well as workshops, but it was very, very difficult in terms of workshops. Because if it's more than, say, 15 people, then you, you're not going to get that intimacy in that space. Um, my, po my art side of it is my poetry events, which I ran, went online. And that actually got, was better online. I found uh, because now you have a diversity of acts from across the UK, and not even just from across the UK. At my events, you have say two acts who are based in London, and then you have like one guy who was performing poetry from South Africa, for example, or another guy performing from India or New Zealand because it's online, so you can have anyone from anywhere. So as far as diversity and diversity of performance acts. Um, it's a, it was a lot better online because now you get my experience, especially from um, artists and performers centred in the global south, um, which you don't you won't get um, in, for just from having in-person events. It goes back to what you were saying, 
how we're so reliant on space. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I've got a younger brother as well, so my brother's 14, <coughs> and um, all his school stuff went online, and it just reminded me of the fact at how colonised curriculum is. <laughs> I was like, I was sitting in his, I was, what, sit, sit in his classes, and they were talking about immigration um, in geography, and the fact that they were talking about immigration in, ge in terms of geography, that with no discussion around colonialism, and how these people are moving from their country to the UK of some miraculous, like, non-existent history. Um, a lot of these people come from places in the Commonwealth. It's just a euphemism for empire, anyway. Um, because Britain went there and told them that Britain existed. But, um, yeah, but, yeah, it was just reminding me that we do, we do really need to have a decolonial curriculum um, and that sort of stuff. But my history work went online, talks went online, workshops were difficult. Lectures were good, um, articles, all my articles are online anyway, uh, predominantly, so nothing really would change on that front. Thank you. I don't really have very much more to add, yeah. that's the note Ben has already been fed to me if I should stop it. And yeah. um, I guess one thing I do want to say is a bit about COVID really highlighting the fact that, and this is to to Trey's point about place, the only access to collections at BCA is if you come to London. And having the archive being down for 18 months, I think really obviously impacted a lot of students, a lot of researchers, and this kind of, we were really quite slow to pick back up, back up again because our funding was really cut. We had to reopen much um, fewer hours than we were able to open before as well. So that kind of had like a dramatic impact on just our ability to function as an organisation. But we were able to move online but going to speak to Aisha's point that we have no IT infrastructure. So there's a bit, the digital divide also became quite obvious. So whereas mainstream or national institutions were able to move quite quickly to move creatively, we're like, oh, that looks great. That's fun. How are you doing that? I can't afford the licence for that. Yeah, so it was, it was that, that made it so much more obvious. I'm also going to talk about an institution, I won't name, who came to BCA just after we reopened to talk about a project that they'd done because they wanted to do some rapid collecting around George Floyd. And they were kind of a do first, think later approach. And they were like, so we've got all this information, we've, cre you know, we've, cre we've captured all the creativity around it, what do we do with it now? I was like, I don't know. What are your ethics like uh, things that you put in place? And they're like, no, no. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm a FedEx. So it's like, yeah, the kind of mainstream institutions kind of moving, 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 and having the kind of capacity and ability to move really swiftly, but maybe the kind of thinking behind it is a little bit later. But yeah, that's one. I don't really have anything to add. Thank you. That, that, what you've just said really resonates with my, my experience. Just casting uh, ahead of today, I thought, well, I'll, I'll look back at my diaries and try to remind myself of how the last two years unfolded. And actually, by my reckoning, I don't know if I've got this right, we actually had three lockdowns rather than just, than just one. So, and, and I, I feel, work-wise, I'm still very much in a sort of a, a, a post-lockdown moment where I'm managing projects that were uh, postponed or deferred or recalibrated as a result of well, the, the, the three lockdowns. And then, of course, we have Omicron and the adjustments that need to be made around that. And, and now, of course, we've had the, the death of the Queen as well and, and more sort of compulsory postponements of events. So on October the 5th, I'm hoping to uh, run a digital event that was first meant to happen in May 2020 and then was meant to happen on the 19th of September 2022. Um, and so hopefully I'm, I'm going to finally be able to tick that off the, um, off, off the list. But um, Certainly my, my experience in March 2020 was having those remote meetings and all of our attractions, it's clear they were going to have to shut down. We didn't really know what, what was in store, but the sense was um, we have to do something. So we came up with a something and because it was something, that's what we had to do. Um, so our, what, I, what I think the, uh, in terms of the last, the last couple of years, looking back, um, it's quite hard to make sense of a lot of what, what happened, a lot of the decisions that were made. 
I think I was saying to Sophie earlier, uh, I think this would make a fantastic PhD for somebody, not necessarily now, but maybe in five or ten years' time. Let's look back at what happened um, during that, those, that, that period of, of, of lockdowns and try to make sense of it, because I, I'm still struggling to make sense of exactly what, what went on. Um, interesting also to, to think about um, schools and, and learning, because one of, the, one of the things that my department has historically done in the, the sort of the pre-COVID period is what we call virtual outreach. So that's using video conferencing platforms. We, we tend to use Skype in the past um, to um, do outreach sessions to schools in the, in the UK and, and overseas, normally on a history or archaeology theme. And we, we do maybe nine or so a year. And then, of course, um, a demand for those absolutely exploded because um, school trips couldn't, couldn't happen. Then we had the, the period that, that you were talking about, Trey, when, when everyone was, was doing homeschooling. Goodness, what a nightmare that was. Um, which I think was at the beginning of 2021, wasn't it? But it's, as I have to say, it's quite hard to remember the, the exact sequence of things now. Um, so that, that meant that um, we, we um, uh, that's, that's something I'll look back on certainly very proudly and where I think that's, that's uh, um, where we sort of upscaled our digital provision and it really seemed to work and it, and it, it met a need. So my, my boss wrote various funding applications that were successful, allowed us to build capacity for delivery of this, this virtual outreach service. And then um, in February 2021, we ran our Viking Festival entirely online. So it, it shifted, it had, it had run in 2020, in February 2020, just when there were sort of mutterings and murmurings about this, this mystery illness that might be, might be on the horizon. Um, and in, in, in 2021, we'd, we'd moved the entire Viking Festival online, and that really seemed to land at just the right moment, because, you know, typically February half term, there's not much going on anyway. We normally, we've normally cornered the market in terms of family-focused events, but to put on a week of, well, in fact, it was two weeks because we did a schools week prior to the, the main festival, to provide a series of events that people could attend either with paid for tickets or for free. In that moment, when everyone's fed up, when it's dark and cold and wet outside and the kids are, have been stuck in the house with you all day doing their, their homeschooling, that, that really worked. Um, now, the difficulty really with, the, with um, looking at that as a model for doing things in future is there's nothing really to compare it with because um, 2022 hasn't been like, like that, and there, was, there were no years prior to that where we can look back and say, well, that was exactly the same sort of uh, situation, the same circumstances. Um, so I'm, I'm wary about drawing any conclusions about um, the things that, that I was involved with, uh, and that seemed very successful in, in the moment, because it seems un unlikely that the circumstances were hopeful. It's unlikely that the exact circumstances will, will replicate themselves um, in, in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, everybody has really different roles and jobs and things that they're involved and interested in. And I think we can see that just the array of ways in which the last few years have really posed challenges with COVID um, and the ways in which digital technologies have maybe been used or misused, or you know, the pros and cons of them. Um, the use of the digital technologies over the last few years. I wonder if any of you have any thoughts, perhaps, on whether the last couple of years have set new precedents for the ways in which people expect history to come through digital means. Um, it's been a quite an intense couple of years, so. Um, I'll start with one word, Twitter. This um, is something I did wonder it can, about. It, it can be your best friend, and, mm. um, it can be a good way to hold other institutions to account, whilst at the same time it can be horribly revealing of the racism and discrimination that exists. Um, in terms of setting trends, um, I would say it's done an awful lot of good in terms of educating people about British colonialism and st stuff like that. Um, uh, so the, the 
death of Queen Elizabeth II on Twitter, it was it was chaos for the like first four days. But like organised chaos, it was amazing. <laughs> it was so on one side you had so Irish Twitter um, to start with came out um, and they were educating folks about the potato famine and things like that in 1845. And you had like whole about um, the British monarchy's abuse of Ireland. Um, and then also then you had African Twitter talking about the Mau Mau uprisings in Kenya in the 50s. Um, and then Caribbean Twitter would come with dis discussions about colonialism and slavery. But then on top of that, then you had um, indigenous Twitter from the United States and New Zealand with the Maori people talking about colonialism in New Zealand and America. Um, so you had all these different groups showing solidarity together um, against the institution of the monarchy to a degree that I did not see after the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter. Um, so I think in terms of education, um, social media, so I'll just say when I say social media, I mean Twitter um, and Instagram to a certain degree, and also controversially, I'll say TikTok is quite a good, quite a good <laughs> platform in terms of actually public history um, and educating people. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just probably start with social media there. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. It was yeah, social media and its power to. Yeah bring people together. And um, on the kind of consumption of I said history on TikTok particularly, but I don't know, has anyone been following the um, TikTok Bridgerton musical saga? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. So I wonder your questions about creativity in um, lockdown. It kind of reminded me, so for those of you who don't know, um, someone created their own musical based on Bridgerton. Yeah. And it was very, very popular. I think, was it like 2020, 21 on TikTok? For those of you? Um, but it's kind of escalated now, where at the time the producers of Netflix and Shonda, um, Shonda Land? Yeah. 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 Well, the, yeah, Shonda Land is the production company, were like, oh, this is cute, this is sweet, this is sweet. Um, and now the producers of the kind of TikTok Bridgerton musical have sold out, was it the Madison Square Garden or something? Yeah. To perform. Yeah. But uh, they've been sued, basically, they've been sued by Netflix now for breach of copyright. So, um, and I think at the time they were like, this is cute, this is cute, this is cute. Can you please, you know, pay us some, or can we come to some licensing agreement? And then the writers were like, no, no, we're not going to do that. And now they've basically been sued. And I just think, for me, it's kind of a really interesting thing about social media and copyright and the kind of how things are consumed and reproduced in a way that it's kind of fine to a point because most people are like, oh, it's, it's on social media. We might not, you know, pursue our copyright claims until money is being exchanged. Yeah. And then it becomes a different issue. And I think that's really, that's been a really fascinating thing. And on Instagram, I don't know if you probably follow some of them, but there are some really big social media accounts that uh, produce and show black, black British history and Caribbean history. And they have tens and thousands of followers, even more, even more so than BCA, because our, our Instagram is good, but it could be better. But I just think there's obviously a hunger for not necessarily um, needing to research one's own, you know, to, to research it yourself, but as a way to, as you know, kind of a public issue to, to show research that's already been created. But some of them, I say, yeah, are copyright infringing. But I don't know whether the institutions themselves are how bothered they are about that. I know, um, kind of teaching online, I was kind of teaching BA students um, uh, British kind of social and economic history. And I think one thing it really showed doing it entirely online was, I mean, first of all, the assumption that students could have access to reliable internet, to, uh, to laptops, to all of this. Um, and so I remember um, constantly, I feel slightly sorry for my head of department who I was butting heads with because I had a, I had a bunch of students who, who couldn't get, well, they didn't have access to reliable internet. And so they needed uh, to be able to read the things that they needed to read for the class. Um, they had to be in PDF form so that they could download them when they had the internet and they would be there. But obviously because of copyright and all sorts of complicated things, there was a lot of stuff where you have to have, you know, active internet and open and, you know, we all know the chaos of reading things online and what does this mean? And yeah. And so, yeah, the, the copyright and kind of, I guess the internet in some ways, and especially over lockdown, has given the assumption of we can have access to everything at all times. Um, and also, there's, you know, the kind of thing that's always said about the internet is, which, you know, is true in some respects, and, you know, I agree with the sentiment of, you know, everything exists, once it's online, it exists forever. 
And anybody that's done research online or does stuff online knows that it's definitely not true. <laughs> because when you want to find something, it's not there. And the internet is actually very ephemeral and it's very difficult to like actually catalogue. And when I have friends who um, research digital games, um, it's it can be a real nightmare because they're using things like blogs, they're using forums and things like that, and all of a sudden if the company decides it, it's gone. And it's totally gone. And at least, you know, because I look at very old board games, unless someone breaks into the Bodleian and snatches a bunch <laughs> of things, then my archives are usually pretty safe, you know, touch, ooh, touch wood. Um, uh, but, yeah, so I think it just kind of showed, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it just really showed the kind of ephemeral nature of the internet and also kind of, yeah, so much to do with copyright because people all of a sudden, you know, people, you know, they want to see stuff and they want to have access to stuff and, and, and yeah, and kind of people think, well, if it's on the internet, then surely I can just share it and, yeah, I think people are kind of reckoning with what the internet is and the kind of, the boundaries of it, the legality of it is, yeah, interesting. With an archive, I mean, the nicest thing about going to an archive is being able to interact with the material, to actually touch it, smell it. I mean, I love sniffing paper. I'll document the different types here. So I guess, I mean, with, with, it, with it having to be online, and then um, say you're, you're doing some kind of seminar online and you have to send material, then there's a thought of, well, one, you can't send the whole thing, you can't send it in time, newspaper, but whatever you have, once you've sent it, they've got it. And so then what's the incentive for them to then engage with you again? Um, unless you can then think really creatively about how, what, what material are you going to send? How are you going to, to, to sort of present it visually so that it is still yours as an organisation but accessible to people? Um, I don't think I've found a solution to that yet, to be honest with you. Um, I forgot what I was going to say actually. Um, don't worry. I do that all the time. Yeah, I was in the middle Start of the point. Off the train, it's gone. Um, I'll leave it there. Oh, come to me and I'll be back. Oh, I'll give you back the microphone quickly. So I'll okay. hand over to whoever. Did you want to add something? I was going to add something to the, to what, is that okay? Go yeah. By all means, just interject at any point, guys. Because I used something from your archive for a uh, chapter I wrote recently, for, well, recently, academic recently, a year ago. It is for Monopoly, yes. Um, and I, and uh, it was when everything was like super closed down and um, it was through the Google Art stuff and I was going to ask about, or I was really curious about how does that work and yeah, it was, I've never come across material in that way before and yeah, I was, sorry, I feel like. <laughs> no, this is, this is great, this is what you want, just, I want to add, see where it goes. I'm not committed to copyright, just in case it came across that I was like, copyright. It's, imp it's important, I mean, legally you have to follow it, but I'm not committing to it as an idea. I'm just going to put that down. <laughs> so, what's your, uh, what's your specific question about the Monopoly? Or oh, the Google Arts and Culture? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering about Google Arts and Culture, kind of how, what happens in terms of material going through Google and things like that. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I asked Google and I still don't know the answer. So, um, Black Culture Archives is in partnership with Google Arts and Culture. Please do check out our page on their website. So we've created a lot of exhibits. And one of the um, things, one well, parts of the agreement was that Google came in and digitised huge amounts of our archives. So as I said, you know, people say, why didn't you digitise everything? We did. It's on Google. I have issues. I have some issues with that. Um, theoretically, it's only available through the Google Arts and Culture, and they've assured me that you cannot download it. That is not true, because I have downloaded things myself at home from the Google Arts and Culture platform, and you can screenshot. So, I mean, and this is to do with the initial contract we signed with Google, which I'm not going to go into, which was problematic for, sm for small organisations dealing with large corporations and contract management. And you didn't have a lawyer. Is quite complicated and not recommended. Um, so there are lots of like issues there. I mean, the one and um, so thinking of what I said at the beginning about digitization doesn't not doesn't necessarily mean access. So actually, only through the Google Arts and Culture can people access our digitized collections. So during lockdown, we did end up having to send quite we did end up sending quite a lot of people to the Google Arts and Culture platform to look at material. But that is decontextualized. There is a bit of metadata there, but it's actually completely random, I think, how Google filter it. Yes. So unlike um, a digital asset manager where you can you, you have the context, you know what the collection is, you know what copyright status is, that's just material floating around in Google, which I fundamentally am not happy about, but 
been support <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm trying to think through it. We have no other way of making our material currently available in a digital or digitised kind of way. But yeah, that's the question. Uh, just reflecting on, on the real work with, with audiences in, in one way or another, and I'd be interested in hearing panellists' thoughts on um, whether you think people uh, are enjoying digital opportunities and access through digital means where previously it would only have been through through physical means and I suppose it's only fair sort of I've, I've mentioned one of our successes which was which was the Viking Festival in, in, in 2021 and the, the foregoing the schools week that went before that but it's only fair that I mentioned things that maybe weren't so successful so when we tried to replicate uh, an online uh, events program for um, summer 2021 it didn't really work it didn't really and um, it didn't really pick up in the way um, that, the, that the Viking Festival had. And I, I, as I say, I guess that the Viking Festival had, had worked because of exactly when it landed in the year while people were, um, were living with those sorts of um, restrictions. Whereas in the summer, I think people were, had had quite enough of sitting in front of screens and there was a chance to, to get out and about and do things maybe you've not been able to do in 2020, 2021, which is why I guess I, I'm. Um, somewhat sceptical about the, a, a sort of a complete uh, the idea of a complete switch from in person to to digital but certain other of the things that I that I, uh, I work on and again I, I haven't reached any sort of resolution in my own mind I organized an annual conference that we did in 2021 completely online and in 2022 we, we did blended uh, and in 2022, we, we really didn't do the numbers that we'd done in, in 2021. Uh, and we, we'd not done it as a blended conference before. And I think with conferences, that probably is the way forward now. I think the expectation is that you will offer that as a means of opening access for all kinds of reasons. Um, but do, do you, any of you have, have any sort of reflections on where you think people's psychology is around using digital versus in, in person? I think one of the things that COVID highlighted was how culturally ableist society is. And no amount of policy changes is going to change that. Like it's a culture that's been fostered over centuries of hating people with disabilities. Um, and that history goes back to colonialism and pre colonialism as well. When you think about, when I say disability, I don't just mean physical disabilities, I mean mental health conditions as well. I think about chronic illnesses, um, chronic health conditions, um, neurological, like ADHD, autism, those sorts of conditions as well. So society's lost a culture of that. And so when COVID hit and dis disabled people were thrown under the bus uh, by the government, essentially, um, I wasn't entirely surprised because that's the culture that society has fostered. The government isn't exclusive in that. They are a product of society like any other institution, that's university, police, um, prison, so prison, people in prison, disproportionately autistic and ADHD as well. Um, so, yeah, I think when it came to COVID and um, access to events and stuff like that, and the, 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 um, how quickly institutions moved from um, physical to hybrid and vice versa, it showed they could have made changes but they didn't because it didn't benefit them and it wasn't economically benefit. And that goes back to neoliberalism, what you're saying about class mm -hmm. as well. So the new the universities stay are neoliberal in their in their constructs. So that means basically um, putting individualist narratives ahead of um, community. Um, so it's about the individual and how the individual can profit. And the individual does not the individual profits from exploitation. So that's where we sort of talk about economics, getting rid of billionaires, <laughs> stuff like that, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think COVID highlights a big um, um, disparity with disabled people, and of course that's intersectional as well. So the more, the more marginalised groups you fit into as a disabled person, the worse it is for you. So disabled, um, while black, for example, so you've got races of unableism going against each other. Um, uh, people uh, disabled uh, in the LGBT community as well, so then you've got, you've got three, so 
come on, groups of fit into the worst is for you. So um, COVID-19 hit the marginalised even worse, already marginalised, um, and institutions didn't care because they were already discriminated against, already doing that discrimination. Um, but they weren't thinking like that either. I, I found actually that COVID-19 was seen as separate from Black Lives Matter, because COVID-19 hit in March 2020, and then George Floyd was murdered. I think it was May 2020, and university treated COVID-19 as George and George Floyd as two separate incidents, when they should be treated as, as one incident, um, because racism and ableism and medical racism and things like that, all they're all they're all part of the same system essentially. So um, yeah, when it came to COVID um, and the movement from hybrid um, to in person and vice versa, institutions could have done stuff years ago. But they, they chose not to because it wasn't economically beneficial to them. Um, does everyone follow me? It makes sense, yeah. I was going to say that because, like, in terms of like, ah, you could have done that. <laughs> but it's, um, so I had a, um, a heart condition which left me um, not able to move very much and having to use a stick for a while and so physically kind of restricted. And it was amazing where it was kind of like, oh, like, you know, I've noticed everyone else around me was saying, oh, you know, I want to get back out there and I want to do this. And I'm like, no, <laughs> stay online with me. <laughs> but it was, and it was, it was, it was just that awareness and that so many ways being, you know, the internet is not accessible for everyone. And then in other ways, it, in terms of like disability, it was so liberating having stuff online. And I, you know, in, in that time I felt, oh, I can still actively engage. I could still attend conferences in a way which I could not do otherwise. Um, which I guess then you could bring in questions about labor and <laughs> the kind of hierarchy, but I feel like that's a discussion for another time. But yes, but in, in terms of like how quickly hybrid hybridization and online could be mobilized was very, I think for a lot of disabled people was a real moment of like, oh, okay, <laughs> I see how it is. <laughs> it, it could have, we could have been working from home. It's not essential at this point, but yes. So yeah, I agree in terms, I think there's a lot of people I, I mean, I can't speak for psychology a lot. I know it's great in terms of seeing people face to face and in terms of meeting people and maybe it's just me, but kind of com online conferences can be really great, but you don't potentially get the social aspect that you do with, you know, chatting and things like that. Or maybe I'm doing it entirely wrong and people are chatting online and I'm just really bad at it. Um, but, but yeah, but then also just the accessibility of it. It just, yeah, it's highlighted quite a lot in a quite an interesting way. Yeah. Which is what matters. Because then if you're just having stuff in person, you won't be you're imposing that you must come in person rather than having both options. Uh, basically you can have hybrid and I think hybrid should be the norm. Um, and even if people come disproportionately come online, the whoever's running the conference should should be able to absorb that cost mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, and that's basically anti capitalism. And that's what I'm advocating for. <laughs> You'll find that I, all, all my work is inherently anti-capitalist in its approach anyway, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Aisha? Yeah. yeah, I think obviously hybrid has become the norm, but I think there's challenges with that as well, and I know I'm, I'm guilty of sort of, sort of thinking, but I want to go to an event, but oh, it's online, so I'll just not bother going, I'll just engage online and then, oh no, I forgot, never mind, it's recorded, I can w watch it some other time, and then end up not doing it at all. And I think, um, again, because at Black Culture and Archives we're talking about quite sensitive topics, so doing that online, particularly say if it's a webinar to a white corporate audience and I can't see them, I can't read the room, so I don't know to what extent what I'm saying is, is being understood, accepted, if people are tutting, if people are turning away, I have no idea. And I kind of, I mean, although I really did love being at home, I didn't really mind being locked down. It's only, I, yeah, I did, honestly. Quite, I'm quite a homebody. Um, but we lost our US audiences, who used to come quite regularly. And then when we opened up and they came back, that was when I really appreciated the benefit of having them there and being able to discuss kind of the similarities and differences with, with the, the US, UK, um, in terms of education, in terms of what we understand by civil rights and things like that. And yeah, it, it can happen online as well but I think and again we all know you, you, you arrange things online and then get sold out and then like five people actually come on the day so I don't know I guess we need to think about ways of incentivizing people to actually 
engage, whether it is online or in person. Um, and I suppose what you're saying about dis disability is interesting, because I suppose, did it kind of feel like um, the, the rest of the population suddenly thought, oh, here's this novel way of engaging, and then it's kind of died down? Yeah. In the same way that, again, with, like maybe Black Lives Matter, it's like, oh, let's engage, and then it's died down, and how do you kind of see that I moving guess. forward? Oh, I, I don't know if you wanted to answer. Oh, that. Uh, well, I guess just from a, yeah, just from a personal perspective, it definitely felt like there was this almost like this like bright new world of mm. all these different ways of engaging and doing this, and then and then it started to go away. And I was yeah. like, no, come back! I can actually do these things mm. now. And, and um, so yeah, so it was a, yeah, it was it, it's it's interesting mm -hmm. because. Yeah, and also again teaching as well, being very sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, teaching as well, being very aware that I've then just kind of being like there is no perfect solution, and you know, and then also kind of I'm really aware of you know kind of asking things to be hybrid. You're asking for like extra cost and extra labour, and and so it's 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 difficult. I think that's the thing of like it's complicated and difficult, <laughs> as it is with most things. I think one of the things that I know I was guilty of is this idea about moving the physical online and expecting to replicate the physical online. And how many of us, I don't know, I have it, I'm doing it more now, but thinking about the digital not as a replication of a physical space, but actually as a different space and how you work differently. And obviously hybrid can complicate some of that because you're like, you're physical and digital, so how do you do that? And so, um, as one of the things I'm thinking about is like obviously like critical digital studies. So yeah, thinking about how the digital is a space, obviously in and of itself, that isn't just a replication of us all sitting here. And um, I had another point, but I can't remember what it was. But yeah. No, thank you so much, Chris, for that question. That actually really touched on some of the stuff that I was going to ask surrounding not only accessibility but the things that we lose by just thinking about the digital turn and this hyper digital society. Um, which is really, really interesting. Um, and I really want to continue it a lot more because I feel like there's so much more we really need to draw out, not just that we want to, but things that are really important to highlight um, and to bring out. However, I'm aware of time and I'm sure we have lots of questions in the audience. So I'm going to open this out to the floor if anyone has a question. Charlie can be um, a roving microphone very helpfully. Um, so go for it. Lovely orange shirt over there. Um, my question was for Trey. Um, it, it seems to me that your work is a lot about you intend to um, influence people and educate people in political fashion. Um, what is your preferred uh, media, if you will, or approach um, that you think works best for changing opinions or getting people's emotions or, you know, working to influence people? And is it digital or is it not? It depends what the subject is as well. Um, so, for example, I did an article in June um, on the Jubilee, uh, which got some, I guess, animated reactions from people, <laughs> which is what it was exactly designed to do. Um, but I wasn't and it was in, it wasn't a journalism publication. Um, I will avoid journals at, at any possible cost if I can, because most journals are behind paywalls and nobody can access journals. Even if you're an academic and an extra position, you, your institution won't have access to all journals, only ones that they've subscribed to. Um, so even for, even in academia, journals are not accessible to everyone. So I tend to go for um, open access websites um, and journalism publications. Writing exactly what I tend to would write in a journal, but just putting it in an open access website that most people can access. But even because it, it's digital, not everybody can access it as well, which is, which is the way which is where there's a fine line. So I think in terms of what, what I'm writing, in terms of what I'm writing about, um, so the Jubilee article was something that I wanted to do quickly and get out there as fast as possible. Um, and it went up, and I think it's now nearly, I think it's 2,000 people have seen it. Which is quite good for like a regional um, journalism publication. It was local to my home county, to Northamptonshire. Um, 
and um, uh, many of my local community um, did look at it and it did change some perception uh, because you walk around Northampton and there's Union Jacks everywhere and everyone was saying how great the, the monarchy were and then I basically did a, I think um, Victoria described it as a, uh, like a survey, a British, a, British, a literature survey of the British Empire, which is basically what, essentially what I did and plotted it to the um, public reactions to the Jubilee, to the street parties and everything. So for example, in the Grenfell area in London, they had a long table for the 72 victims of the Grenfell um, fire tragedy, where nobody attended, and they left it out there as, like, as, as a political statement, uh, whilst people were celebrating the Jubilee, so I included that in there. Um, I included Instagram posts in there, so the, many of you have heard of the journalist Afua Hirsch, she posted on Instagram about um, Kojo Karam's book, Un Uncommonwealth. Um, so I used quotes from her Instagram posts and linked that in there. Um, I used local historians from Northamptonshire as well, and local journalists uh, from Northamptonshire, and also wider literature from more well-known historians as well um, in, in that text. But I published it in journalism, because I know people would be, more, would be more like to read it in a journalism publication than if it was in a journal. So I think in terms of what I'm writing, Generally, it has to be open and accessible in terms of uh, not only how I'm writing, but um, the me the way people access that as well. So um, I wouldn't put record, I wouldn't put half of referencing in it, but I would I would, hype, I would embed the hyperlinks within the within the text, which I think is where academia needs to go. To be honest, because I don't like referencing either. So <laughs> um, it just because every discipline has their own form of has their own from reference, I know history, it's, it's a Chicago in history, because I'm a public historian, but I didn't do a history degree, undergrad or master's degree. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I love that you say that. Uh, I love that you say that, and I just say, we just say, as long as it's consistent, yeah. we just do you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I do articles, I do it in spoken word poetry, as I said earlier in my introduction, um, so I do a lot of poetry events, so I'll, I'll talk about empire, I'll take what I do, put in essays, and put it into like spoken word poetry. So a lot of you might have heard of the channel um, Button Poetry, which is based in the United States, um, and they put a lot of their stuff on YouTube on videos and stuff. But I basically take that political slant of empire and stick it in a poem, and then go down to the local poetry event or mic night or whatever, and do that through that those means. Um, I've made, done YouTube videos. Um, did one for my local theatre actually on the history of mental health and racism and medical racism and that was a video um, so yeah it depends who, who um, what the audience is and what I'm trying to say but I know with something like Empire and colonialism it would be much better to have an article where people can keep going back to it um, than sticking it in a video that's 35 minutes long yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, One more question, Thomas, I saw your hand first. I don't know who went first, but yours was the first one I spotted. Um, is it? Yeah. We'll go for both. We'll run over by a few minutes. It's fine. Go, Charlie. Hello, um, I'm, I'm not good at collecting my thoughts concisely, um, so I apologize for how long this question will be, but um, I was just wondering, so I'm, I'm also uh, an artist, actually, I'm a communication designer, um, is what I did my undergrad degree in, and I had noticed um, on Instagram in particular, after the murder of George Floyd, um, a particular type of um, post that was starting to pop up um, that was circulating at least on my algorithm. It's like uh, sort of short, informative types of posts that are really specifically designed and circulated sort of amongst like liberal circles of people. And um, it comes across as, you know, and people, people posted and reposted and post and reposted right after. Um, and it, you know, it comes across as as performative and, and just have people feeling like that they had to post. Um, and I just found myself wondering like what, who these are for, because I think also um, with the algorithms, they, they were ending up just 
amongst the same people over and over again. I think I was thinking even aesthetically, uh, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but um, I think anyone uh, who wasn't actively engaging with it would dismiss it because it looks it looks liberal. It's like got a design to it. It looks like liberal media. I don't know how to explain that exactly, but it's like there's a specific look to it. It's not um, there's like a conservative aesthetic, and then there's like a very well designed like 2020 design aesthetic for these Instagram posts. And I think I think people either dismiss it or it gets circulated amongst the same people. So I was wondering if you had seen any of those. If you had an opinion on what that type of uh, information, like who it's for, and if it's actually useful. Um, I think when it comes to like vehicles and performance and stuff like that, it's worth tracking it historically. Um, going back to civil rights, Mark and Max talked a lot about white liberals and racism um, and how it's often much easier to see it. I think a few liberals, because it's not just performative, it's the, it's the persistence and the persistence, for, it's the approval grabbing, essentially. Um, so I think when it comes to, to those posts, and if they keep doing, and they, they don't just post them, they send them to you to make sure that you've seen it, and so that they know that you've, you've seen what they're doing, and they're sort of seeking the approval of a black or a brown person um, to basically validate what they're posting. Um, yeah, so why, and, I'll actually, I'll say it's very, what's more common for me in feminist circles, and I'll be quite open with that. Um, white feminism, uh, white supremacy has um, gotten worse because of white feminism. 52% um, of voters who vote for Trump are white women. Um, we got Trump because of white women. Um, that's not, that's not, that's not a, uh, uh, me being hyper, hyperbole, that's the fact, that's the that's statistical data. Um, and white feminism within the groups I move through, so period drama groups, ancient century studies, mind effect studies, um, predominantly cis white women who think they're liberal, so they're quite happy to say they're feminist. When it comes to anti racism, they're like, nah. They're like, so, yeah, I think when it comes to liberals and whiteness, there's a, there's a strong connection between that. And um, if you want reading on that, read Sham Sullivan's Good White People, because it's it's um it's really revealing about um whiteness, feminism, and liberalism and politics. So you, you could you could still have friends that are liberal, um, and say they're for Black Lives Matter. When it comes to dismantling whiteness, they're like, no, I like my privilege. <laughs> so that's basically what they're saying there. Um, does anyone else want to chime in? <laughs> no. Okay. Good. Uh, did we want to finish off with our last question? Oh, it's, it's fitting. So I'll turn it into the conference. Yes! <laughs> you, you started this one. I'm going to finish it as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick question about, let, let's say that we uh, erase public and we say British. Um, to what extent the digital changes the British history or British heritage? Because you've been working with different audiences through the digital, so American audiences, or you were mentioning the Queen and mm -hmm. reaction from all over the world. My question is, to what extent the digital forces you to change the definition of British history, or do you not do British heritage, British history because of the digital? Do you have an example? Do you think it, it changes the way you, uh, you work because of the digital term? Became more international? Is this and, one or just? Yeah, it's, it's a general question. I don't know if you have one um, example in your work. Yeah, I think most of my work is digital to some aspect, whether that's social media or journalism or, or whatever. Um, I think because a lot of my historical work is local as well. So when I say black British history, um, a lot of my work is focusing on histories outside of major cities. It's the provincial stuff, the stuff you hear about in seaside towns and like countryside. Um, Northamptonshire is very, it's very it's, it's a town, but it's also got a lot of rural aspects to it. So um, that's why I sort of draw along, draw from period dramas as well in terms of historical. So I find myself more represented as a black person in screen media, in period dramas than I do in contemporary dramas. Because you'll find when you watch general TV shows, most of them are set in London or major cities. But then you watch a British period drama and it'll be set in somewhere like, I don't know, um, Folks 
coast and down in Kent coast, coastal town. Sanderton was set on the coast. Um, and a lot of these British period dramas are set in small towns and coastal towns. So I think in terms of my work, it's opened up quite a lot. So people are learning to learn, they're learning about Black Northamptonshire through my work that I would never have got in just a physical space because then I'll be limited to people that live in Northamptonshire, my community, and people that are just travelling here. But then when I put stuff online, um, more people are learning that there is a black history that isn't Bristol or London or Cardiff or Glasgow or, or whatever. Um, and that's basically that's the, the best basis to my PhD as well, where I'm looking at the Windrush story of Northamptonshire. So whilst Steve McQueen, for example, was, did the small acts films, um, and he looked at like, blues parties, for example, in the Lovers Rock episode. Northampton also had their own blues parties in the same years that there were blues parties in London, um, in the 50s and the 60s. So I think when it comes to my work, more people are learning that in Britain that there is a British history that isn't set in the major cities, the urbanised flat British history, um, but one that is very country set, country and rural, um, especially like, based off like, um, Corinne Fowler's book. Um, Green and Peasant Land, for example, does delve into that a little bit. Um, and even stuff like um, Afropean, like Johnny Pitts. It's not a history book, but it sort of is. It's sort of history, sociology, and politics. Um, and him and my uncle have actually come out with a book. Um, so Johnny Pitts and my uncle Roger Robinson, who's a poet, um, <coughs> have just published a book called um, Home is Not a Place. And it's essentially the way they toured around England, Scotland, Wales, and even into Northern Ireland looking at black experiences of the country and the coast and, and so on. So I think that's the stuff I'm interested in. But if I just have that in my community, um, then I'm preaching to the converted, essentially. Um, but yeah. Sorry, I beat you to it. Um, I think for Black Hawks and Archives, in answer to the question about the Britishness, that is pretty much what we're trying to do. We're trying to trouble what Britain or Britishness is. And to speak to your point about Windrush, so, um, and as Stuart Hall talks about, so much of it is about this idea of migration into this white national identity, which is something that these days, Windrush bugs me, but um, we, we try to really try and untangle that and bring Britain not as the island or the islands, but Britain as the empire, and how questions of belonging and migration are so intertwined from a you know, five, six hundred year period that this is, that isn't just about whiteness and trying to descend to whiteness from this idea of Britishness. And so the digital does afford that in a way that we can have um, transnational conversations, we can theoretically have conversations with people in the Caribbean about this shared, partly shared British identity, but you know, lucky for them, independence. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously it, it allows for some of those conversations, but fundamentally, yeah, what we're really about is, I mean, we call ourselves a home of black British history, and there's lots of tension around, well, why is it black British? Why is it not just British? Yeah. And I think sometimes we use things as a shorthand because it's easy for people to understand, and, you know, you, you might get less pushback and resistance, rather than going, we got the home of British history. <laughs> that, might, that might trouble some people, but yeah. Predominantly, they're two in England. Like, if I'm being, when I look at the literature or whatever, predominantly, when they say Black British history, they mean Black history in England. Because um, I went to Scotland in October 2020, I went to Edinburgh, and then you walk around Edinburgh and you'll see like Jamaica Street and stuff like that, and then you'd go and see the, the Henry Dundas statue, um, who has been cited as like the great delay of abolition as in by one um, author, but then you go to Wales, and then you'll see how the black Welsh story is completely different to what blackness is in England, yet you're, you're homogenising everyone under Britishness. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Yasmin Begum, did a good article for Gaudem on the 1919 race riots. Um, and her activism in Wales has basically, she's been um, followed by police and stuff like that. Like her, her activism is so, uh, I guess, uh, political and pushing, asking the right questions that is, she's been um, followed by police and stuff like that around it, and she's been watched and stuff like that. So yeah, um, you can go on her Twitter, <laughs> um, it will show, show you like, what she experiences, but Black Wales, Black Scotland, Black England, completely different um, landscapes altogether. Um, yet we say Black British history as if it's one history and it's all the same, and it should be very separate. And even 
what happens in Northamptonshire is different what happens in London, what is different what happens in Liverpool. Um, very different cultures, but within the same country altogether. Yeah, I was actually, yeah, thank you. What you said, Hannah, is what I was pretty much going to say, but then what you were just saying, Trey, is interesting. I think it's really important that we also interrogate what we mean by British, because for sure, yeah, the way the way race is constructed in Liverpool is, is very different to the way, as you said, in Wales, but also, I mean, in, in Scotland, because I mean, I, you know, as a black person, I've always been raised to say, you're British, you're British, you're not English, you're British. And then as an undergraduate, I went to study in Edinburgh, and all the Scots people said, you're English. So I'm like, well, I thought, well, yeah, I guess so. So I think we, there's, there's, then I mean, as historians, we can deconstruct every possible phrase. At some point, we have to agree on what, what terminology we're going to use at the time. But I think with Black Cultural Archives, it was more, it wasn't to do with digital, it was more an institutional shift away from when our founders began in a, in a, at a time when it was very difficult to find um, the evidence they were looking for, I guess, to start, well, originally they wanted to start a museum as well as an archive, and so they went out collecting items that, that related to people of African descent, but it could be anything. It was, it was that one of our, I can't remember the exact wording of our earlier mission statement, but it was all artistic material relating to people from Africa, the Caribbean, the USA, so basically everything from everywhere. Yeah, all people everywhere. And so that, that just wasn't practical uh, over time, and I think as we've developed more professional archive practices and we, we kind of focus the collections more on the community that we're in and wanting or the communities that we are in and wanting to strengthen the communities that we're in and wanting to make a change in Britain because so much so much more is known about the US than Britain and that's always one of the first questions I start my talks when I ask people to name some civil rights figures I don't even say US civil rights figures I say civil rights and everybody comes out with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and I say what about Britain and then it's like oh well we don't know we don't know because we haven't learned it so yeah, very focused on here. Yeah. Well, I feel that's all super important. I was going to talk about play, and I can say it's silly, silly now. But um, so just in terms of play as public history and the difference between digital and not digital, I think at the moment I'm seeing more and more there's quite a lot of historians who are like, let's make a game about my research, and that's almost like kind of like. And for some reason, that'll access every child in the country and like kind of, okay, that's not really how it works, but okay. But in terms of, there's almost kind of a, an idea if you say, we're going to make a video game, we're going to make a digital game, it's like a magic wand and it's going to make it, you know, it's going to get all this engagement and stuff like this. Um, when actually, I mean, video games don't have to be expensive to make. You can, you can go on Twine, you can do stuff like that, which is open, free resource. I would encourage anybody who's interested in kind of nonlinear narratives, that's free, super easy to use, intuitive it's really great to play around with, but the kind of stuff that they're imagining is really expensive to make and takes a lot of people with a lot of expertise. And, um, and, so, and so kind of, the, and so then there's the, I'm thinking about, you know, stuff non-digitally and actually a lot of digital games are prototyped in, uh, in analog, in analog format. And actually, you know, exploring that way is also really productive as well. And I think sometimes there's kind of, you know, when something's like a new thing, and at the moment, and it's like, at the most like AI, we're going to get AI to do something. Like, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you want it to do? What's the purpose of it? What's the outcome? And stuff like that. And so I see that sometimes quite a lot in play because they'll be, you know, oh, the kids are playing, you know, Fortnite, which is probably now really old, <laughs> like Minecraft and stuff. And they're like, we need to do something with that, which I applaud kind of the thing of wanting to reach people on the, the place that they're existing. And there's lots of fruitful stuff done within that space. Um, but also, yeah, just kind of the the digital has its own problems and has its own, and especially with stuff I've seen sometimes when I've worked with historians and um, I've tried to say to them, you know, you're a fantastic historian, you know your stuff, you're not a game designer. <laughs> and game design is a very specific, you know, skill. And, um, and yeah, get a bunch of historians in a room and ask them to make a game and you will not get a game at the end of it, you will get an argument. <laughs> um, which I've been in those rooms. <laughs> And, um, and so, yeah, and I think just in terms of the kind of impact of the digital and stuff, at least in that aspect of um, public history and the kind of playful spaces, um, yeah, the digital isn't a kind of magic wand that will suddenly give you access to all these, you know, different ways and different things like that, that actually it comes with its own set of problems and its own kind of skills that, uh, that are needed. But yeah, that's just something I've observed in that area. Sorry, I just want to say something really quickly, and then I'm going to pass it to you, so you can talk. I just, I completely forgot to say, which has nothing to do with anything, I don't know why you reminded me, but 
Uh, Black Cultural Archives' official charity title is the African People's Historical Monument Foundation. So okay. thinking about your question about British and public, the monument idea, the idea of monument... I don't know where I start words I can't say. Monumentalization of history and impacts and how to bust open questions about Britishness is, is, is embedded in the very name of the organisation and actually it's the African People's Historical Monument Foundation, brackets UK, close brackets, for reasons that I will tell people about that length if anyone asks. But yeah, I just kind of, I don't know why you, rem you reminded me, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to make that point, monumentalise it, just so that it it's said in this space. That's, that's important. Um, well, I, I suppose I've spent quite a lot of my time thinking about Vikings, who are, on, on, on the one, one hand, quite, quite silly, we've spoken about silliness, on the other hand, I think they occupy a, particular, a particularly interesting and, and unusual space within um, conceptions of Britishness and ideas um, about, about nationhood and, 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 and the authorised histories of, of Britain and unofficial histories as well. There's probably a conversation for... Uh, for, for another time, but um, I think there's there's um, there's a, a lot a lot that's interesting to 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 say about um, about quite where where they fit into the picture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, you about Vikings, like in the um, period drama space as well, like it comes to to pictures of Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and people like that. Um, Black and brown people are often excluded from that history, um, but then I started reading and saw that Viking isn't exactly a race, but it's something that it's a it's it's a thing that someone can embody. So you can become Viking, um, and the Vikings went as far as North America when they were uh, travelling around the world, and even to bits of Africa reportedly. So they would probably would have been African Vikings, but then when you then you start talking about that, um, then it starts getting complicated and. The, these sorts of places are probably best to have those conversations. Um, but then when you're online as well, that you can't have any more conversations about anything. <laughs> so um, so um, someone becomes Viking. So I think I watched a film at least called The Norseman, um, which I think was done by Robert Eggers, I think. I can't remember the director's name. Um, and all those stories are inherently whitewashed in itself. Um, so when it comes to Britishness within those sorts of contexts of the Saxons and the and, um, and the Jews and the Vikings and whatever, there were black and brown people in, in those times. But what Britishness is and what's become, I think it's quite it's quite a modern thing. But I think if you track it, you can and you can track it. Like Britain has always been multicultural. Um, so African Romans here in York, um, African Romans in Cumbria, and in. Um, in Eastbourne, which is now a very white community, but in the Roman times there were African women down there as well. So, like, um, yeah, I think I should probably end, end on that. That even something as obscure and very hard to research as the Vikings, because it's so busy in terms of history, there was diversity, I think. And that's where I'm going to end. So, if I start um, ranting. <laughs> yeah. No, not at all, Trey. I think that's a really important um, note to end on. Um, there's so much that I want to unpack, but I feel like I have to hand over to Victoria to close the conference. But um, would you um, all join me in giving our lovely panel a huge round of applause? Thank you for such a wonderful discussion, guys. Victoria? Thank you. Thank you all so very much for closing out the day. Um, it was a really broad, wide ranging discussion, um, and I think that is a fitting end to the day because we've had a very broad and wide-ranging discussion. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers um, and panellists from throughout the day. I think it's been a fantastic and inspirational time um, for me, certainly, and hopefully for you also. I think it shows the breadth and depth of research um, and engagement that is going on in public history um, at the moment. But more particularly, at the end of the day, I would like to take a moment to applaud the organisers of today's event. Um, so, that yes, you should stand up, my friend. Uh, they are Morgan Craig, Ellie Dudgeon, Hannah Houston, Charlie Kayser, Kirsty O'Rourke, and Esther Wilson. 
Um, without them, this conference would not have happened. working on this since October or November um, of last year. Uh, for those of you in the room who are starting the MA uh, in the coming week, uh, I'd like you to consider this your call to action, uh, that uh, hopefully we'll have the same event uh, next year and it would be fantastic if some of you in the room would be willing um, and able to uh, support it. Uh, she's not here, but I would also like to extend my thanks um, to um, a member of our support staff within the history department, Helen Crevels, uh, and the reason that you were eating food today and drinking coffee today, and the reason that those of you who are speaking today or got trains today is because of Helen and the way that she handled um, all of the um, administration. So I am endlessly grateful to her. Uh, and finally, last but not least, I want to thank uh, YSTV, York Street Television, uh, for the live stream today. Uh, they have been quietly uh, but expertly delivering uh, this conference to an online audience um, and it has been just wonderful um, to work with them. And so now all that remains from me um, is to invite you to join us in the treehouse for a glass of wine and some canapes. Um, the canapé menu uh, includes butter bean crostinis, which I think is just like posh beans on toast, um, something to do with goat's cheese, some prawns, anyway, it sounds divine, um, so do come upstairs and eat some uh, canapes with us, drink some wine with us, um, and talk some more about uh, the themes um, that have been raised today. Uh, for those of you who are not able to join us, I wish you a very safe onward journey. I feel like I'm a train conductor now. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to say, right at the very end of the day, that um, this year, one of my favourite seminar experiences was uh, where I was speaking to the students. Uh, we, were to, we were discussing shared authority and power and identity. Um, and at the end of the seminar, uh, we ended up scrawled across the board with just the words, end capitalism now. <laughs> and, and so I feel that the discussion that we've had on the panel really resonates uh, with that energy, um, so it was good to hear that here today. Thank you all so very, very much, uh, and I will see you upstairs for some wine.